Good evening, I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, National Chair of the Women's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicines and Women's Journey, thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Health Conversations That Matter. A woman's journey always strives to improve your well-being through health education. Tonight's discussion is very timely because November is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. According to the American Cancer Society, an estimated 64,000 people will be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in the United States in 2023, almost a split down the middle between women and men. Pancreatic cancer has rapidly increased over the past several decades, and it ranks as the fourth leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. Survival rates have increased during the past decade and now approach 11%. Tonight, we are pleased to be focused on improving survival of pancreatic cancer through early detection. We are joined by cancer pathologist and gastroenterologist, Michael Gogans, director of the Pancreatic Cancer Early Detection Laboratory, whose research interests include developing tests to improve the early detection in pancreatic cancer and their outcomes. So please use the Q&A on your screen to ask your questions to Dr. Gogans, who will respond during the last 20 minutes of our conversation. Our webcast will conclude at 8 p.m. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for their production assistance. And you can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I am pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Gogans. Welcome. Pleasure to be here, uh, to be part of this wonderful uh, series uh, for the public on health conversations. Our topic, is, as uh, Kelly mentioned, is improving survival of pancreatic cancer, early detection and prevention. The outline uh, briefly is some pancreas basics, um, a little bit about uh, some context around cancer screening tests and, and uh, applying it to the general population versus high-risk individuals. Um, and so who are the candidates that we currently um, consider appropriate for pancreatic surveillance, um, what are our outcomes uh, when we uh, have people engage in pancreas surveillance, and a little bit about future directions. Uh, so a big question, of course, is why is pancreatic cancer uh, survival so poor? Uh, and that uh, brings us to a little bit about the pancreas anatomy. Uh, what you're seeing is uh, uh, on the left and right, the, the context where the pancreas is, it's in the abdomen surrounded by the stomach and the duodenum near the bile duct and, and the liver. And, you know, on the right, you're seeing a little high up, um, this little arrow showing one of its functions is to produce the secretions, the pancreatic enzymes um, that, that help you digest your food. But this anatomy is also uh, the reasons for the symptoms and maybe why the symptoms occur late. Uh, if for any budding histologists, uh, this is what the pancreas looks like. It's basically largely a solid organ uh, that you have the two main cell types there. The light pink little circles are where you make your insulin and other hormones. Um, and these other cells in here in, in the purple are where the enzymes are made and they get secreted out the main ducts. And if you were uh, wanting to see it on a, a scan, what you're seeing across the uh, the middle here is just a slice across the abdomen. Here you have your, your pancreas here as a, as a main duct running through it where the secretions would come out. Um, you have your liver nearby, uh, some vessels in here. This is where there's some contrast. So it's in the middle of the organ. You know, it's near the stomach in front of it. Uh, you know, it spread occurs in these vital areas where there are vessels fairly readily. It's a fairly thin organ, and that creates some of the challenges early detection. Um, so some of the symptoms, um, many of the symptoms, in fact, um, that can occur, um, occur because of the local anatomy. Uh, some of it has to do with the, the effects um, on, the, on the glands uh, functions, the pancreas function. So you get abdominal pain, usually in the middle of the abdomen, uh, sometimes uh, in the middle of the back, where the pancreas can, um, 
can uh, uh, a cancer can go posteriorly. You can lose weight because you're not uh, digesting food or not feeling like eating. Maybe there's some blockage to to the the local uh, stomach and and duodenum. And so uh, I know these other symptoms: uh, loss of appetite, jaundice, um, because you block the bile duct. You know the the weight loss and and um, lack of energy and other other systemic effects, weakness and fatigue. If you interrupt the 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 um, the, the sugar uh, metabolism, you know with the insulin production, you can get diabetes. Other other symptoms: fever and chills. Um, uh, maybe you're blocking your your bile duct and causing trouble there. And other things: blood clots, depression, diarrhea. I'm running through those all very quickly. Um, it's not, of course, they're very important. Uh, but in fact, a lot of the times uh, when we have these symptoms, uh, they're often late. Not always. Uh, you you know, we're 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 of course need to be vigilant about symptoms that can be um, occurring from pancreatic cancer, but they often are occurring uh, when. The cancer is already not at, at its earliest stage. And, and of course, a lot of times, some of these symptoms, you know, I have jaundice or, you know, there's something more specific, but often they're relatively nonspecific. A lot of reasons why people can have some upper GI discomfort, pain or, or nausea or fatigue. So that that poses challenges. Obviously, you can visit your uh, doctor to try and uh, tease out what's relevant. And, you know, you can get um, um, tests on if you have symptoms. Um, the context of doing um, early detection work is largely focused on, you know, uh, following up uh, certain groups of people who we consider high enough risk um, and and uh, scanning them, et cetera, looking for signs of trouble long before there's any symptoms. So, and, and you know, again, the progression here of pancreatic cancer is meant to show uh, you can have a small tumor that's localized and we can call that a T1 and that we'll see is uh, you know, survival can be very good. Uh, this is uh, the, the the local anatomy, the main duodenum and uh, the vessels around. And that'll uh, spread. Um, it can invade the local organs, uh, invade to the lymph nodes here, which also um, you know um, affects uh, the ability to have cure and of course spread to other organs like the liver. And a lot of times when people are presenting, they're presenting when the cancer is already. Uh, spread to local lymph nodes or uh, often to other organs. And that that does limit our ability to uh, achieve long-term survival. Uh, sometimes the gland will atrophy uh, because you're blocking the main duct and it, you, you literally get a smaller gland and it's affecting the, the digestive enzymes or the, the insulin production. Um, so, um, and, and of course, the, the the, the concern everyone is uh, aware of is that most people with pancreatic cancer that's advanced stage uh, will not be cured with chemotherapy or other therapy. But having said that, occasionally they are. So um, even though we're we're very much after early detection, um, you know, you are you do see these examples where you can have a dramatic um, survival benefit. This is a, an example of a CT scan, and that's the liver and the the, the stomach there. And this this here is showing what are you know, fairly large liver um, uh, mets, as we call the cancers, already spread there. So normally that would not lead to cure. Um, but this patient who had a, a BRCA2, inherited BRCA2 mutation, um, was sensitive to um, this chemotherapy that we had, we had started a trial over 10 years ago. And within weeks, um, there was a dramatic improvement, and he, he ended up living over four years and dying of unrelated um, causes. So that does occasionally happen, um, and you know the earlier the cancer is detected, uh, the more likely chemo is going to work. Um, although it, you know it doesn't it doesn't often have these dramatic effects. And of course, people are interested in you know is there a way to improve immunotherapy, et cetera. And this talk is not really about um, therapy responses; it's really more about uh, screening and early detection. Um, and you know, can you cure it if it's early enough? And and as as was mentioned. It's not the commonest cancer, although we're seeing an in uptick in incidence in, in men and women. You're seeing it's it's ranking down here near the bottom of the top 10 kind of thing in terms of incidence. Um, and uh, but the survival is is a uh, poor four uh, percent uh, uh, or sorry, four four ranked fourth, 11 percent five year survival, which is an improvement in survival. Um, so how do we deal with this challenge of 
the the uh, incidence is quite low at the moment. The average incidence in the population in the U.S. is about one in fifty-seven. It has been creeping up a little bit, and that seems also, you know, to some that might seem like a lot. Um, you know, there are a lot of other common cancers that um, that. Uh, you know, we have to be con uh, concerned about, and of course, other diseases, you know, cardiovascular disease and strokes and things that uh, can can cause concern. But even then, you see this risk is spread out over many decades. And so it's not as though at any one point in time, I'm walking around with a one in 50 chance, you know, it, your your chance is much lower. And that um, uh, ability to identify uh, that, that someone was uh, at risk of pancreatic cancer is also affected by this. And I'll try and tease this out a little bit for example one of the goals of early detection would be to develop from a scientific and medical point of view as well could we have a simple blood test which would help us diagnose the cancer and the performance of the blood test would depend on uh you know having a test that could uh, where the results would be you know only high in the cancer patients let's say and all the all the normal patients of course without cancer many more of them they they would have their own range, but they would never overlap. You never have a blood test where the normal people would would behave like the cancer people, and it just doesn't work like that. Um, you know, more often than not, you're dealing with um, the healthy people. Some people who are healthy will have the blood test in the range of the cancer uh, levels, and and so you're stuck then dealing with the interpretation of that blood test. And you you run the risk then you know we can call that specificity. Who doesn't have cancer? sensitivity who does um you know what's it, what's the right cutoff for the test you know if we put the cutoff here we'll get all the cancer patients but we'll, we'll the test will will indicate well there's a lot of healthy people that actually have a, an abnormal test and you have to go and chase down what that is and that creates uh worry um and that those numbers matter a lot so if it's a rare cancer um it's a lot more to deal with than if it's a relatively common cancer Women will get mammograms and other breast cancer screening tests all the time, and they have to deal with a lot of false positives. But, you know, it's a relatively common cancer. And um, and so in, in following up on it, you know, it, it could be better, but it's uh, there, there are challenges when you have to follow up on a blood test if you're, you're not sure what the significance of it is. And this this plays out if you, you do a scenario where you have only one person in 5,000 having a cancer, you know, you're going to have... Um, 500 people out of 5,000 with a false positive result in this example. And then on the other hand, if you if you have it where you you keep it only very few people in the population are, are given a test, you know, you use a cutoff um, where very few people who are healthy have a false positive, you're not going to get all the cancer uh, diagnosed. And so this is part of the challenge, how, how common the cancer is in the population um, it imposes uh, challenges on how we can apply a test to the population. And, and you know, because ideally we'd love to screen people, all people at a certain age with a simple test and, and, and be able to do a better job of detecting uh, pancreatic cancer. But the numbers uh, don't make it easy. Um, uh, and we don't want it because we don't want to be doing harm, if you like, to healthy people. And so it brings up, well, is there any role for blood tests for pancreas screening? Um, you know, one of the uh, great I I tests of interest these days has been the circulating tumor DNA tests. You know, the idea that DNA shed from a cancer will be detected in the blood. And that's certainly true uh, to a certain extent uh, for many cancers. And there are multi-cancer detection tests uh, trying to, you know, deal with that. And that they, they have um, very potential. Uh, they're, they're also used for people who have cancer to try and help manage um, understanding how they're responding. Um, and uh, the Hopkins uh, group has uh, done, um, you know, uh, wonderful studies in this area. Uh, for example, this is a study where a, a multi-cancer detection test was applied to uh, 10,000 women, uh, published a few years ago in Science. And what it showed is, you know, these cancers detected by the blood test on the left and, and the other cancers overall detected and how many cancers in different organs that were detected. And a lot of, in, in general, in, in asymptomatic individuals, again, reflecting the fact that pancreas isn't isn't that common. Uh, none of the one, none of the women had 
the pancreatic cancer. Uh, and so that th this was a wonderful uh, sort of first glimpse at applying kind of tests like this to the population. Um, but what it also, uh, what we've also shown in, in, in studies that we've done and others that um, when you're applying it to look for the early stage pancreatic cancer where it's most curable, the test is usually negative. So that's the 30% of people with stage one pancreatic cancer where you're, you're mostly going to be um, correctly uh, figuring out who doesn't have cancer. So we need to be able to do better than that for, for a test for early detection of pancreatic cancer. It's a little better uh, for other cancers. Um, and and we'll, as we'll see, the, the, the stage one aspect is, is quite important. So how do we do uh, pancreatic uh, surveillance now? Well, uh, we have been doing this for a while at, at Hopkins. Uh, we, we, we started what we call the CAPS study, cancer of the pancreas screening, in the late 90s. Um, around the time I started my lab, my, my fellow gastroenterologist, uh, Dr. Canto, started a CAPS program, and we soon began working together. Uh, these are all basically the same study, uh, you know, the last decade or so. It's been a multi-center study that, that we lead, which is called CAPS-5. All to say is we've been doing this for a long time, following a lot of uh, uh, people who we call high-risk individuals, or HRI here. And these are people who have a significant cancer risk um, based on having inherited um, certain cancer gene uh, mutations or variants uh, listed there. These are the, the BRCA genes and, and some of the other genes um, and some rarer syndromes as well. And, and um also, uh, people who have certain family histories, uh, generally they need more than one first degree relative with pancreatic cancer. Um, in other words, like a, a person who's a, a sibling, parent, and then um, you know two of those or uh, one one connected to another uh, by uh, one degree. You know, so a parent and a grandparent. In other words, a first degree and a second degree relative. And we do that based on the likelihood of um, a person getting pancreatic cancer uh, with those kinds of family history. And meeting the age criteria, which is mainly middle age, um, and then the surveillance we'll come to is, is imaging. And again, our experience has been gathered over many years. We've held consortia um, at Hopkins and, and you know in Baltimore, uh, two of these to try and bring the international community together. Um, and so this field has slowly um, uh, progressed, and so you know to be, uh, become uh, to start from a kind of investigational. Um, consideration in the clinic to uh, something that we apply, um, recommend for, for people who meet the criteria. And and this is the an example of a pedigree where you, you would have a family member, a f uh, family members where pancreatic cancer has occurred in this case, um, these uh, two men. And so you have an, um, other affected individuals, relative or unaffected relatives who would be eligible based on being a first degree relative. Um, People who uh, uh, are siblings, um, for example, in this example, uh, this young person would be too young. Um, that that gives you some idea. But if it was just one affected member in this family, in the absence of any genetic abnormality identified, we wouldn't recommend surveillance at this time, at least. Uh, maybe we, if we had a better test. And this gives you uh, this uh, set of figures gives you some idea of what the family history um, of pancreatic cancer gives you in terms of uh, a lifetime risk. Um, if you're looking at the, the bottom, you, you're seeing here these low curves. Um, and basically, these are kind of the same curves. One is if there's a family member with young onset uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, so these curves are higher. Uh, this, this bottom curve is sort of the baseline if you don't have a first degree relative with pancreatic cancer. But as you um, if you have uh, pancreatic cancer in a, in a first or second degree relative, um, the the uh, the uh, incidence is high, especially if you have more than one. Right, you're seeing this incidence go up to 0 0.2, for example, here, 20% lifetime. If you have three first degree relatives with pancreatic cancer, and this is this risk is very low. You know, in your 40s. Uh, starts to go up a little bit in your 50s and, 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 and you see the curve taking off. And so this reflects what our practice is, is to try and identify people who are at these ages of 50 or so um, and, and to take a good family history and understand 
uh, understand uh, if the risk is sufficient. Um, and so we're not in, enrolling people who have one relative with pancreatic cancer, but we would if they had, if you like, more than one. And the other thing we do is uh, to try and clarify this risk in, in, in family members is uh, if you have um, had a relative with pancreatic cancer, a close blood relative, you could consider having a, a blood test or, or a saliva test for uh, you know, a genetic susceptibility, uh, which you can get in, in the U.S. fairly inexpensively, um, a panel of genes. And this is just indicating that this is something we, based on work we did some years ago that, it, you know, when you, when you take people who have pancreatic cancer, um, they don't have to look like they have a cancer syndrome in their family where there's lots of cancer or there's lots of pancreatic cancer to realize that maybe it is inherited. Most of the time, we don't see a clear evidence that it is, but, um, you know, maybe five to 10% of people with pancreatic cancer have a, a fairly significant genetic reason that we can identify, and therefore other family members might benefit um, from having that test done. Um, and that would sort of clarify their risk and sometimes determine whether they should get surveillance or not. Uh, again, similar, uh, different uh, guidelines showing that evidence uh, that we support that. Um, and even in people who come to us, you know, the ones that have uh, mutations that, that they've been inherited tend to be at a little bit higher risk lifetime uh, compared to those who don't. This is work we did some years ago. Um, so we start screening around age 50 uh, for family history criteria a little earlier to, if you're a mutation carrier. Um, and that that surveillance takes place over a long period of time. And it, it's um, and that, again, is why we have to, uh, I think, for the moment, limit it uh, because we're, we're recommending scans that are, um, you know, typically annually. Uh, what about these other risk factors? We mentioned family history and genetics and age. Um, uh, of course, smoking is is important. Uh, smokers have a higher risk, um, you know, that, that gets to close to a family history risk if you're a significant smoker um, and but some of these other factors are, are relatively modest. Um, people with diabetes in general, people with obesity, um, certain racial uh, uh, factors have a modest, uh, if you like, association with with having an increased incidence. It's not not terribly significant. All that's to say, um, and heavy heavy alcohol, um, rare, rarely people with chronic pancreatitis where there's a lot of injury. Um, we will we will survey those, but most of these we don't yet have um, a, a simple way of quantifying that. Oh, well, therefore you should automatically get screened uh, because again, this lifetime risk question, if it's still relatively low, even if you're a smoker, um, we haven't um, yet reached the point where we're routinely recommending that. Um, even though these are factors that that do influence um, risk to a, a modest extent. Um, obviously there's other, and there's other reasons to, you know, have a healthy, uh, diet and lifestyle and, and, and um, avoiding smoking, which uh, needless to say. In our thinking about this, we, um, we're thinking about people whose lifetime risk is around 5% or higher, uh, developing pancreatic cancer. And, you know, we, we're trying to sort of do, do as much good without doing unnecessary harm. We don't like to be telling people to get annual scans if the likelihood of needing them is relatively low. And that may change as our as we make progress um, with other kinds of early detection tests. Um, so what has our experience been? Uh, this was a, a, a publication we, we uh, reported on last year. Um, it was a multi-center study, our Hopkins uh, team, uh, myself and Dr. Canto and others, and, and um, some of the other institutions involved in the CAPS program here in the US. And they're listed here. We, we follow several thousand people um, and, and other people with pancreatic problems uh, are part of the study as well. Uh, but it's these high-risk individuals who have these family history and, and inherited mutation criteria. And so, um, and then going back to what we find, thankfully, we find very few people with pancreatic cancer, even in these, you know, fairly significantly enriched families. They're all in the various degrees of surveillance over, you know, some uh, many years, others only a few years. And we've we've identified a few dozen uh, pancreatic cancers in that time in this cohort. And this, at the time of this um, 
uh, a publication uh, which we 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 presented, um, you know, based on a, a period of funding um, to provide an update. You know, we had fifteen hundred or so people developing uh, uh, or being surveyed for a relatively short period of time, and you know, how many cancers do we get? So when we, when we look at this, uh, what do we what do we find? So here you have two examples, two scans. One is an endoscopic exam, endoscopic ultrasound. A little hard to make out, but you're you're seeing the pancreas here, and this this irregular abnormality here. And this is a early pancreatic cancer. And the same here. This is an MRI scan. Uh, you see the other organs, and you're seeing this little small area, it's just a centimeter in size, um, and thankfully localized. And uh, patient did very well afterwards. A stage one pancreatic cancer. And so people are generally getting annual scans who are in the program. Often they're alternating both tests, um, the MRI scans and the endoscopic ultrasound scans are, are generally uh, equivalent. Um, they favor, they're superior to a CT scan based on um, uh, the radiation primarily, but perhaps for some other reasons as well. Um, and so... And, you know, what, what has been the experience in terms of the people who get pancreatic cancer? Well, the, the middle curve here is the main one. Um, this, these are the people who develop pancreatic cancer despite developing, uh, despite having regular surveillance. And, um, they, uh, have had an average survival of approximately 10 years. And so, um, and some, some of the people are still going, uh, you know, that we, we haven't, um, they haven't been diagnosed that long yet, but a lot, the majority of them have had stage one pancreatic cancer. That's that's shown here. And we have another curve down here where the people who dropped off surveillance and presented with symptoms, and, and basically they, they kind of then generally fit the, the life expectancy of people who, um, you know, never had surveillance, uh, where the, many of them are presenting with advanced stage disease. So most of them had stage four uh, this one at stage one, uh, kind of fortunate. He he um, he had came back for surveillance at, uh, about um, almost uh, you know a year and a quarter or so, and so we put him in the uh, dropped off surveillance category. But he he had uh, that might have been a bit unfair. So the stage one people basically, in other words, do very very well. Um, Ten years is a long time to live with pancreatic cancer. Um, not everyone you know survives, but a lot of them uh, will survive long term. Um, this person up here um, had um, who, uh, one person died of unrelated reasons who had one, this curve here, which were people who didn't have cancer, but who had um, a kind of very concerning HGD, meaning a high grade dysplasia, kind of like a cancer in situ, not yet invading, which we do look for as well. So, you know, many of these people did very, very well. Thanks for their, uh, thanks to having been um, undergoing their scans. Um, on an annual basis. And it just shows you what is possible with pancreatic cancer. Long-term survival is, is, is absolutely possible if it's detected early enough. Uh, an example here, he, um, this um, gentleman, he, uh, from Maine, um, he's actually a retired doctor and he allows this uh, photo, uh, but he's 10 years uh, since his diagnosis um, and, and had his uh, scans and he'd come down to Hopkins for his scans and, and, uh, he had his operation with us. So, uh, you know, doing, doing very well. Now, if you, if you take all the people in our a group of people who are uh, being surveyed, um, in, in the CAPS group who meet that, you know, family history and genetic criteria, roughly one in 200 per year will, of surveillance will get pancreatic cancer. So it's still a relatively small number. And that, is also why generating this data takes a while, um, because it's it's um, it's uh, limited to people who meet these criteria. So it's uh, you know only a smaller fraction of the total number of people who end up getting pancreatic cancer. Uh, but at least we have this kind of data to to um, to work on, um, and and we're continuing to try and do a better job of estimating risk. Um, one uh, additional study that we um, uh, we published a few years ago, that should be 2020, um, that um, what is the role of insurance and basically access to care? So this is a little bit different now to the high-risk individuals. This is just looking at the general population in the United States and how likely are you to have a stage one pancreatic cancer? 
Well, a lot of it is luck um, because sometimes people can, you know, have symptoms for a week, get evaluated quickly, and they still have advanced disease. And many, many uh, people are aware of that. But some people will have symptoms that will drag and um, they're subtle and they, they want to get um, seen, you know, by a doctor, maybe get a scan, et cetera. Um, and what does this show? So this is showing that if you have optimal insurance uh, in the U.S., which is not always optimal, but Medicare, um, you know, sometimes Medicaid, the optimal insurance, you were, um, you know, likely, this was the reference, um, much more likely to do, be diagnosed with a stage one cancer than 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 if you didn't. If you didn't, you, you know, you were more likely to have these advanced stage uh, cancers uh, by a very significant amount. So this access to care um, is relevant. Having optimal insurance is relevant for early detection of pancreatic cancer when you're uh, talking about developing uh, symptoms um, just in the general population. And if we, if we look at what the data is in the U.S., is you know maybe maybe these people who do well, maybe they're just all these people who are getting screened and they're different. Now, in the general population as well, if you have stage one pancreatic cancer uh, diagnosed, and, you know, and staged according to having an operation and the, and the pathologist looking at the results, you have a long-term survival that's really excellent. Here we're showing five-year survival. Um, around 80% for people with stage one pancreatic cancer, which is like, what? That's not what we understand, right? Whereas here, you're seeing the people who have the other stage pancreatic cancer. And this was the year of diagnosis. This work we published again some years ago. And the survival has improved a little bit. But again, it's this need to get the cancer early where you can have a very dramatic difference in outcome. And so this is work we are, you know, continuing to try to do more for, um, but uh, it, there, there is a lot of hope that we can, we can uh, make improvements. And as therapy gets better, you know, if somebody has a st earlier stage cancer, you know, they can, um, they can respond better to treatment, they're healthier still. Um, and one of the issues is not only having the scan, but having the, the right kind of scan when it, when it comes down to it. Um, there are different kinds of CT scans. Um, one is we, you know, a pancreatic protocol scan. It's sort of a dedicated scan of the pancreas, even though it's within the abdomen. You get an, a, a scan of related organs as well. Uh, similarly, uh, the endoscopic um, images are 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 kind of quality images. They're very user dependent, so it takes skill to do these uh, tests well, especially the endoscopic ultrasound. Um, MRI scans are not all the same. The magnets differ and the radiologic interpretation differs. And of course, there's a great interest in artificial intelligence and being able to, um, uh, you know, uh, do better with that. But, but still, this, the actual scan matters a lot. So it's something to be aware of. Um, yes, these artificial intelligence is doing cool things here. You're seeing examples where this is work from our Hopkins uh, team <laughs> identifying the pancreas in uh you know having t trained the the uh the ai to identify it compared to other organs and identifying tumor and normal and normal duct and things we're we're making progress and the hope is that you know sometimes these uh, scans that where you get hundreds and hundreds of images um and you maybe you're coming in for a different reason and the radiologist um maybe they'll miss something uh very subtle uh that eventually the ai probably not to the distant future will be applied to these scans to help with the routine diagnosis. Um, here's another example, um, such cool things. This is, you know, just picked out from the computer, from the, uh, from the scan data. Uh, my colleague, Elliot Fishman, a, a wonderful radiologist. So um, anyway, um, what about doing um, improvements in early detection? Um, you know, can you um, make improvements? Uh, we, one of the things we've been doing is trying to personalize blood tests uh, for for um, pancreatic cancer or the detection. Um, some people who've had to deal with pancreatic cancer may know the blood test CN99, which has been around a while, and is, has some value in uh, following people with pancreatic cancer as a tumor marker. And so we have worked on a tumor marker gene test to try and improve how we um, can use CA199, and that may help us with early detection. Um, and the basic idea is that it's not a one-size-fits-all test. 
basically, uh, you, we can personalize it by w doing a one-time uh, gene test, which helps us figure out, well, how much C99 are you uh, generally going to make um, based on what your, you know, your body, what your genes can, can uh, produce normally. And that would then give us a better idea of when, you know, your test is abnormal. And what that sh is shown is here. If you just take the typical blood test, this is what the, uh, if you take a group of people, you know, you take a hundred people, this is what their levels are going to look like. But it, when you break them down into different groups, functional groups based on their gene tests, you see the levels are very different. And so all these people, for example, the cutoff is normally, you know, kind of around here because most, most of the people are, are in this area. And so a lot of these people then get false positive results. So this is the kind of approach we're trying to take to improve upon our scans. Um, you know, we're not suggesting at the moment that we're going to get to a blood test only uh, place. Um, we need more work to do that. Uh, but having having a, uh, a a blood test in between scans uh, is something we're working towards. Uh, at the moment, we're doing uh, studies where we're, we're matching up the blood testing and the, and the, the gene test uh, for the tumor marker at the time of your scan. So trying to improve upon uh, performance of... Um, of the blood tests, it would is something that we're we're very um, uh, excited about. Is because it's the beauty of it is that it doesn't cost a thousand bucks a shot, and and uh, you're just taking a, available blood tests, and it, you you do a one time uh, gene test that we have at at Hopkins, and that then allows you to to um, have that test perform much better uh, than it would otherwise. Um, so what about prevention? Really, this is mostly a, a talk about early detection, um, but we, we could say a few words about prevention. I alluded to some of them before. Um, we do see precancers that sometimes merit uh, intervention when we're doing these imaging uh, scans. And um, here's an example of a, of a big pancreatic cyst here in the middle of the abdomen compressing the, the stomach. Most of the time, these cysts are not that big. Um, this is what a normal, you know, again, the normal looks like, again, highlighted here where the pancreas is. So this big darn thing here is causing trouble. Uh, thankfully, this wasn't, wasn't a bad cyst. But sometimes we, um, in terms of cancer, but sometimes we see these cysts and we're worried they're going to progress to cancer. So that is an opportunity to intervene. The only trouble there is that actually these cysts are very, very common in the population. As you get older, you know, upwards of 10 plus percent in your, when you're reaching your 70s. And most of these are fairly small and, and relatively trivial in terms of their likelihood of uh, progressing. They do create some concern. Um, and a certain percentage of them will, will begin to cause uh, trouble or look worrisome and uh, we can uh, manage them with an operation. So there is a, and, 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 and sometimes prevent cancer, although, um, most of the time people with these don't, uh, progress. So, um, that's, that's a way of, if you like doing, uh, a prevention. Um, another microscope picture, you know, again, on the top here, you have the pancreas, what it looks like normally, but down here in the middle, you have this abnormal, uh, growth in here. This is just microscopic, but it's blocking all the, the normal, secretions and so all of this uh, normal pancreas is gone and that's replaced by fat and scar and things this is the kind of thing that happens quietly in the pancreas as you get older and some of the people who have their family histories etc and so you know can we do better at detecting these because we can't really see at the microscope level when we're doing a scan and that's something we're working on we call these panin sometimes we'll see these actually on a scan but most of the time we won't uh, that's what the these images are showing here. Um, more, more of the challenge is to try and figure out better ways of quantifying these. Um, this slide shows what we can, what we could do now with pathology as well. We can apply AI to pathology slides and 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 make this uh, this this is what the pancreas looks like here. There's a lot of fat here in the center of the gland, surrounded. There's a lot of loss of the normal uh, profile. And that, that may, you know, reflect a certain risk of progression. But we can quantify all these different organs uh, or cell types within the organ. And um, and that's leading us to give it, giving us a better idea to then link that to the images like their MRIs and like their ultrasound, even quantifying the fat level. So trying to get better at imaging the pancreas.
to figure out risk of progression is something that we're working on. And, you know, we'll take some time to make it into the clinic, but the imaging will, will hopefully improve and help us um, manage people's um, risk better. Finally, um, uh, you know, of course, prevention also means some doing some of the things that uh, are very important for general health. Um, we don't really have much in the way of prevention to offer. Um, you know, obviously, you should stop smoking. You know, a lot of importance around um, metabolism and improving your your, your weight. Um, we're interested in, in, and we're seeing studies where, what if you just applied the artificial intelligence to your medical record? Uh, could you could you have some signal there? That's th these are areas of interest. Uh, we've carried out a vaccine trial where we we um, uh, just as a pilot, but there's a long way to go before that's routine. Can we prevent cancer with a vaccine in the pancreas? This is something that we're working on. Um, similarly, we were doing studies on your microbiome, and um, you know there's a lot you could say about your diet and optimizing your health for cardiovascular purposes and other purposes. We don't really have great prevention tools other than what I've outlined. So in, in summary, pancreatic surveillance can detect pancreatic cancer at an early stage. And when it's detected early, long-term survival is actually likely, especially if it's stage one. Um, it, it, surveillance is only suitable at the moment for people who meet certain family criteria or genetic criteria. And we're doing a lot of research to try and improve this risk assessment and improve our early detection efforts, and to, and to develop uh, get better uh, cancer prevention strategies. So, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is a, a figure of our uh, multi-center international CAPS group when we had our last consensus meeting at Hopkins some years ago. Uh, a lot of great people in this field uh, trying to improve pancreatic cancer outcomes. So, um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Goggins. Wonderful information. We've got quite a few questions. Um, so how about we just jump right in? Yeah. That's time. Okay. So our first one is from Ross. So when when should you seek a CT scan for a definitive diagnosis if you already have symptoms? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question because uh, it, it, it can be a very valuable diagnostic tool, a CT scan. Uh, you know, you're talking it over with your doctor. I think if you have a concern specifically about pancreatic cancer, it should, you know, should be mentioned. A CT scan is a wonderful test, uh, that provides a tremendous amount of information. And so, um, you know, there, there isn't an easy answer. Certainly warning symptoms, people who have, uh, unexplained, uh, symptoms. Obviously, if you have things like jaundice, um, you know, there's there's a, 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 an issue about nuance at diabetes. Is that a, is that a way in? If all of a sudden you develop diabetes, one every few hundred people will will uh, with nuance at diabetes will will have a pancreatic cancer. We think so. It's not an easy one to answer. Unexplained, you know, nausea and, and jaundice or certain lab abnormalities. Again, it's a conversation with your doctor because it's not that easy to dissect that answer on your own. Um, you know, unexplained weight loss, warning symptoms should merit a CT scan. And will CT scans definitively pick up the diagnosis or, or because you mentioned that, you know, not all scans and MRIs are yeah. alike. So let's say you, you end up getting a, you know, it's a neg, it's, it's negative, but you still have these symptoms. Yeah, so hopefully it is another explanation. Yeah, I mean, the, the pancreas scan, um, you know, if you're looking for pancreatic cancer, the concern is often people will have a general abdominal scan or they'll be referred for an endoscopy or they'll be treated for, you know, uh, non-specific GI symptoms with a medication. And it, it's, it's tricky to figure out because most of the time it's not going to be pancreas cancer. Mm -hmm. But yes, if, if you, um, are suspecting pancreas cancer, you definitely need a pancreatic protocol CT to optimally see. And sometimes, occasionally, you won't be able to pick up even when there's symptoms. Usually when there's symptoms, though, the, the, you know, the cancer isn't tiny and isn't that hard to find with an appropriate scan. But, you know, that's, again, the doctors. Um, we will do the follow-up imaging with um, complementary sometimes, you know, a, a, a second exam, an endoscopic exam, an MRI scan can be necessary. It can yeah, occasionally yeah. be hard. To diagnose are these images are these imagings available in 
do you think in, in most places in the United States? Or is it really just sort of in the bigger cities where the bigger hospitals are, like Johns Hopkins? Yeah, the the the, the, the scans uh, vary in quality, yes, and, and access to it. certainly endoscopic ultrasound is the most specialized and the, and the least available. Um, MRI scans, of course, um, you know, in in certain remote areas, it can be a, a challenge uh, to to gather these scans or have have the type of MRI scan with that sufficient quality. So that's uh, we're we're you know we're still figuring out how to optimize uh, rural healthcare. But a good CT scan is available in in many you know um, certain emergency settings. Uh, they're very you know like a ten second scan. So that would be um, usually not the major thing if you're if you're having symptoms. Um, a CT scan would often be sufficient quality, but you know, not, not always, <laughs> not yeah. always. It's a good start. Thank you. Uh, our next question. So this kind of leads into our next question from Sarah, cause she um, lives uh, in North Carolina. Um, and uh, she has a 43 year old son who has the Brock one mutation. And he was told to get screening at age 50. Do you agree and do you agree with with that? Yeah. So what we normally do is take into account the the pancreatic cancers in the family. Um, the if there's early onset pancreatic cancer, then we would start at a uh, younger age. Um, the 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 various genes, the BRCA twos, um, ATM, uh, CDKN2A or P16. You know, P, BRCA one is on the lower end of pancreatic cancer risk, thankfully, compared to BRCA2 and some of these other ones. Um, and and so uh, 50, again, reflecting um, the general incidence of, of relatively modest interest in, in, in incidence in pancreatic cancer. Of course, other cancers are, are possible, you know, prostate and um, even male breast cancer. Um, these are, these are, you know, he, it's good to see somebody who has a, a an overview of all the cancer risks related to BRCA one getting a mm -hmm. colonoscopy done, et cetera. Um, but if fifty is a reasonable age, unless there's young onset pancreatic cancer in the family, in which case we would start earlier, maybe forty five usually. Great, thank you very much. Um, Leah would like to know: Would people who have family history of BRCA one or BRCA two breast cancer? but not pancreatic cancer, be candidates to be screened? Yeah, this is also a very good question. Um, this um, it, this reflects uh, a long history of um, trying to optimize management. Way back in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, you know, us, us pancreatic folks would be, why, why aren't the, why aren't the BRCA people who take care of people with breast cancer are talking about pancreatic cancer and because there's a lot of families where that's you know they would they would go to see experts uh for their breast cancer history and you know their families never had any pancreatic cancer and of course um maybe the incidence has changed and maybe the management of breast cancer much more cancer prevention in this group um you know so um we started with a philosophy 25 years ago of, you know, do no harm, you know, identify the people at highest risk. And so the family history of pancreatic cancer was very important. With our results showing, you know, some promise, um, again, bearing in mind, most people who go undertake surveillance will be okay. Um, we've now felt more that, look, we know how to do this better. Um, and we shouldn't be restricting to especially mutation carriers who are at risk of a variety of cancers. Some of the scans will pick up the rare cancers in other organs nearby that BRCA1 people are also prone to, and they're, you know, their bile ducts are nearby. So we do recommend surveillance, even if there's no, um, you know, a kind of a pancreas surveillance, even if there's no family history of pancreatic cancer in the BRCA carriers. Now, that's not based on our long history of experience because we didn't always do that, but we do think it's reasonable and we expect the data will show that over time. So do you find, so that using that number 50, uh, apparently what this, um, what uh, Sarah you know, was told about her son that once she hits 50. So is that, is that sort of the kind of the age that that was chosen? Do they have facts? I, I guess they have data on that. Well, we yeah, we do have a lot of data in general about how the pancreatic cancer occurs in the, in 
in the general population, how it occurs in, in, in families, at what age is it's diagnosed. And we try to, you know, anticipate the average diagnosis by some years. And in mm -hmm. fact, we have shifted down a few years in general. We used to say 55 and 50, 55 for mutation for, uh, for family history and, and 50 for mutation carriers in general. Some, some, uh, some of the rarer mutations are actually earlier. And so we have tended to shift it down to, you know, more 50 and 45, 45 for generally for mutation carriers, 50 for family history, but we still take into account the other factors. So there, if somebody, you know, happened to smoke or, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there are other, other reasons to bring it earlier, uh, we will sometimes do that. Certainly if they have a young onset pancreatic cancer. So that, that, that's a, a tough question. Um, because, uh, you know, the incidence is low. Uh, most people are going to be fine. Uh, much, much lower, even if you have these, you know, family history risks than in general, if you then when you're older. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, maybe at some point we'll, we'll be, um, um, maybe doing a different test or a less often test when you're very young. But it's still, a, it's still a challenging question to really answer well, because it's not like we, we're very good at really, really outstanding at predicting these things, right? We're just using a lot of clinical judgment. Well, you're getting better. That's the, we're going in the right direction. <laughs> yes, I guess. Okay. So the next question from Desiree, what's the difference between germline mutations and somatic or acquired mutations? Yeah, so germline is meant, even though we take a blood test uh, or, or a saliva test, it's meant to be that you're looking at all the cells in your body and and what what you inherited um, and and carried, you know, from birth, uh, from from your a, a little embryo kind of thing. Uh, acquired or somatic is, is in the context, uh, you know, generally in the context of a cancer, but you know, you could acquire you know mutations in your skin as you get older, right? As from from UV light. So those are those are, um, but you and you acquire them naturally just through the course of age and um, and other factors, and that's what will sometimes be sampling, studying in somebody, let's say, who has a cancer. You know, they they get a, a tumor mutation profile. Those are acquired or somatic. Um, generally, we can sometimes see the inherited mutation in that sample as well. But a kind of a blood test or saliva sample is for germline. You know, a kind of a tumor sample is for somatic. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Uh, Leah wants to know, what is the relationship of diabetes and pancreatic cancer? And, and two-part, and should all late-stage diabetics be screened for pancreatic cancer? That's, uh, yeah, that's also a, a good question. Um, you know, there's a number of reasons why people um, with diabetes can get pancreatic cancer. Thankfully, most of them don't. Uh, they have much more to worry about their general metabolic health and, you know, keeping their sugars down for preventing um, a variety of different complications. Um, so, you know, a slightly increased risk, you know, one and a half times or so if you're a typical diabetic um, who uh, compared to the general population. So thankfully, overall, not not too uh, much higher risk. So we don't generally say, you know, once you reach a certain age with diabetes, uh, you should you should um, get screened. There is this one other factor, which is, of course, if you have a pancreatic cancer, and you know you you never had any diabetes, um, and now the pancreas is is you know getting uh, d you know dysfunction because of an emerging cancer, and you don't have any other sign of trouble. Would it would it, the new onset of diabetes? You know, last year your sugar was fine, and now you now you have diabetes. Should that merit a, a scan? And sometimes when that happens, you may then, ah, well, maybe there's some subtle other findings, you know, I've bit, bit vague symptoms or I lost a few pounds or so we certainly have as a clinical judgment um, that that should be considered in that window of I've just been diagnosed newly with diabetes. Um, and in that w period of the year around that period can can be certainly be a timely time to get a pancreas scan. That again is judgment, and there have been some studies on this. But thankfully, when you're in that situation, most of the time, you know, probably you know, maybe one in every two hundred people it could be for pancreatic cancer. Most yeah. of the time, it's just because as you get older, and for a variety of reasons, you know, uh, people uh, get diabetes, and it's common in the population for all the, the general metabolic reasons. Um, you know, the excess weight and all those kinds of factors. So we don't recommend it routinely. Um, there have been some studies looking at 
new onset diabetes and should we be um, you know doing blood tests or other scans for for uh, looking for pancreatic cancer and that's um, that's sort of work in progress but certainly if you have new onset diabetes it's a question um, should you get a scan like once off is is something that may end up being the case um, but it's uh, not a routine for everyone sure great thank you very much so Deborah would like to know is bile duct cancer related to pancreatic cancer uh, that's a good question. It's it's certainly anatomically very close, and they'll present um, often in similar ways, right? You would you would have the kind of jaundice or pain in a similar location. You can even have the cancer kind of growing it, um, uh, into the pancreas if it's from the bile duct and the bile duct into the pancreas, because the bile duct sort of uh, you know sort of goes through the pancreas before it e exits the duodenum, and um, and, and the um, the genetic factors that we see, um, some of them overlap. Uh, we think some of them are different. So it, it is a different organ and a different has different risks so in many ways. Um, but we we see a similar. If some of these family um, histories, we don't we don't tend to see too much of pancreas and bile duct overlapping. Not not too much. Uh, we do see some of the kind of the rarely bracket. It's not a common cancer, thankfully. Um, uh, but they they can they could be at increased risk for those kinds of cancers if you let's say you're a BRCA mutation carrier. So it's sort of another reason to scan your pancreas because you get the bile duct as well. Thank you very much. We have a couple more minutes. So there's another question from Janet. She says the NCCN still links recommendations for pancreatic cancer screening to family history, even for those with BRCA two, et cetera. What other guidelines guidelines do you suggest we follow? Yeah, and I'm I'm part of the NCCN for for the genetics. Um, so this again is uh, there's a there's a variation in opinion about this because of the um, you know the, do you anticipate or do you uh, and, and using the judgment before the evidence is because in in this context it's very hard to get the evidence accumulated. So, for example, you know, a decade ago, we identified another gene, ATM, as a cancer susceptibility gene at Hopkins. Some of my colleagues uh, led that, and I was part of that. And, um, you know, we had to decide, well, we don't know yet how significant that risk is lifetime. Should we be including people? And we decided that we th probably we should. We anticipated it would be uh, worthwhile. And so that is a judgment. Um I think my view is that we don't yet know well enough. We think the risk is certainly lower if you don't have a family history of pancreatic cancer. But the idea that now that we understand how to do surveillance, many families are small. Uh, they die of other things. Uh, excluding people um, because they lack a family history is problematic. You know, it, it's probably uh, something you can make a case for if you're from a large family. You know, you have 10 siblings and <laughs> loads of aunts and uncles and your cancer history is is well understood and there's not, not a speck of pancreatic cancer around. Well, you know, um, life is short. Maybe you don't need to get pancreatic surveillance. But often, you know, families are small and excluding them, I think, is problematic. Um, you know, especially as more cancer prevention occurs and people survive longer with BRCA mutations, we have to consider that over time they're going to be at risk of other things. So it's a judgment, and the societies have uh, leaned in different directions uh, regarding that, um, such as NCCN one going one way, R R caps going another way, and one or two of the others have have, have agreed with the idea. But uh, you know. That just tells you that the jury isn't fully there and the evidence has not yet been accumulated. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much. Looks like we're getting very close to the eight o'clock hour. Um, I would really love to thank Dr. Goggins for speaking with us tonight. Thank you so much for your time and information. It was very valuable. Uh, Dr. Goggins has graciously agreed to respond to any unanswered questions that were asked this evening. So in a couple of weeks, you'll receive an email outlining the outstanding questions and answers. In the coming weeks, a video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash women's journey under videos on demand. 
And if you, fin- if you have enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey for more information about upcoming webinars, our health insights that matter podcast series, sign up for our monthly emails and register for our in-person events. To learn more and to register online, again, please visit the A Woman's Journey website at hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Thank you. Good night and stay well.